For as long as anyone can remember, and for reasons that no one can recall, William Jarvis has been known as Wally to the teachers, the parents, and the children at Sam's school. The only person from the galaxy of adults to be addressed by their first name in the cosmos of kids. Wally the janitor. Wally the caretaker. World famous Wally. Coveralled, wool capped, and more often than not, unshaved Wally. Wally, who is best known and most loved for the lunch hour every April when he climbs up onto the school roof, and then with every kid from kindergarten to grade eight gathered below him, all of them howling with delight. Wally balances like a knight on a castle turret, balances on the very edge of the school roof and tosses down one after the other an entire year of roofed tennis balls. <laughs> Wally's from Newfoundland. His father was a fisherman, and his father's father before that. Wally was going to be a fisherman too. He used to set traps with his grandfather when he was a boy. But the fishery ended and Wally ended up cleaning windows in the city, dangling over the edge of office towers in a body harness. He didn't mind it. It wasn't any different than being hauled up a mast to unfoul a halyard, and he still got to work with water. <laughs> and on windy days, you got bounced around up there, just like being out in the bay. But it was lonely work. Sometimes Wally would tap on a window and pull a face. And the office workers would smile and hold up their mugs of coffee. And he could count on someone to wave at him and invite him in. Wally couldn't go in, of course. All Wally could do was wave back and winch himself out of sight. But that is how he met his wife, Mrs. Wally. <laughs> she was once one of the women who worked in one of the offices. And she thought Wally looked so sweet working away, and she told all the other women, and they said that she should do something about that. And one day she did. She held up one of her homemade banana muffins, and Wally grinned and pointed down at the street, and darned if at the end of the day she wasn't waiting at the bottom of his rope with a muffin. They got married six months later. She's the only one who ever did anything like that. So it wasn't totally lonely. And Wally stuck at window washing for 12 years. He didn't mind the job, but he didn't love it. He loved his job at the school. Not everyone in the world's cut out to be a school janitor. A lot of people would be worn down by the spilled paint, the gum stuck to the floor, and all that vomit. <laughs> Not Wally. Wally loved it all. Every day was different. There was always some happy kid bringing him a birthday cupcake wrapped in wax paper, or some kid with troubles. Wally had a special touch for the kids with troubles. He's the only one in the school who that little thug Mark Portnoy listened to. One year on the last afternoon of school, a Friday afternoon in June, the June Mark was in grade four, Wally found Mark's art folder in the garbage an entire year's worth of art. Wally saved it until school was back in September. You should have taken this home to your mother, said Wally. Mark Portnoy shrugged. Why, said Mark, so she could throw it out? I saved her the trouble. Wally began to flip through the portfolio page by page. Mark stayed and watched. He said, this is stupid, but he didn't leave. Wally set aside three pictures. Wally said, I'm putting these up in my office. Mark said, that's your problem. <laughs> it was the first time anyone had put anything Mark Portnoy did up on a wall. Next year, on the last day of school, Mark Portnoy brought his art file to Wally. He said, I don't need this junk. Wally went through it again, choosing three more pictures, while Mark stood and watched patiently. Wally just might be the perfect school janitor. And then, one day, he vanished. One day, the kids came to school, and Wally was gone. There was an old man in his place, and no one knew his name or where he'd come from, but they knew one thing. He was a disaster. 
They knew that right from the first morning. Everyone sat in class that morning watching in horror. There he was, his first day, down on his hands and knees in the middle of the schoolyard, poking at the schoolyard drain. There was a a pickaxe and a snake on the ground beside him. The schoolyard drain had been blocked for years. Wally had never gone near it. Wally understood the blessings of a blocked drain. (laughs) Wally understood the pleasures of puddles, the slipperiness of ice. At recess... Everyone tore outside. The grade sevens organized the grade ones to stand on the drain. (laughs) And there was a standoff that lasted a good five minutes before the janitor picked up his stuff and went inside. It was Sam's best friend, Murphy, who got on the case. It was Murphy who went to the office and asked about Wally outright. Murphy who brought the news back to the boys waiting for him in the boys' bathroom. Wally was made redundant, said Murphy. None of them, Murphy included, had a clue what redundant meant. (laughs) Peter Moore was the first to speak. Peter said, redundant? That's gross. (laughs) Jeff said, is it fatal? I think so, said Murphy. Mr. Lovell said, the union is grieving. Murphy tried to get more information after school. He asked the principal, Mrs. Cassidy. Mrs. Cassidy was late for a parent meeting. Mrs. Cassidy didn't even stop moving. Wally's not with us anymore, she said, adding over her shoulder, it's been pretty brutal. There's been some serious slashing. (laughs) Mr. Miller, the vice principal, confirmed it. Wally's been cut. Murphy carried the news back to the boys' room. It's worse than we thought, said Murphy. What are we going to do, said Sam. I don't know, said Murphy. I've got to think about it. Then, that very night, on his way home from dinner at his grandparents' house, Murphy, alone in the back seat of his parents' car and almost asleep, opened his eyes as they passed the school. Murphy opened his eyes and saw him. It was him, said Murphy. They were back in the boys' washroom. Murphy, Sam, Peter, Jeff, and Gregory. Murphy said he was hunched over and moving really slowly. You saw him, said Gregory. His shadow, said Murphy. I saw his shadow. It was huge against the wall, and he was all bent over. Why would he be all bent over, said Peter. Jeff punched him. Jeff said, because he's being cut up and made redundant, stupid. <laughs> I knew that, said Peter. And then Peter, who was getting afraid, said, where do you think they keep them during the day? (laughs) Jeff said, in the supply cupboard, (laughs) with all the other redundant people. (laughs) That's why they keep it locked, said Jeff. They let them out at night and they roam the halls. Everyone was nodding, except Murphy. Murphy was shaking his head. Murphy said, the boiler room. Peter looked horrified. Peter said, all those weird noises. Jeff said, the clanging and the moans. Murphy nodded. Murphy said, it's the redundant people. (laughs) After lunch, Sam got a note from Murphy in the middle of math class, which wouldn't be noteworthy except Murphy isn't in Sam's math class. (laughs) Meet me in the locker room after school. When Sam arrived, Murphy was staring at the rusted door that led into the boiler room. Murphy said, we have to get in there. Sam said, how are we going to do that? I'm working on it, said Murphy. Murphy, who could arrange to get a note to a friend in a math class when he was nowhere near the classroom, is not a boy who favors doorbells. When Murphy comes to call, he comes on the wind. A handful of dirt chucked at a window. The hoot of an owl. Or as he came that night, a flashlight flashing from a garage roof. Sam was already in bed when the flashlight beam played across his bedroom ceiling. He went to his window and he peered into the night. He couldn't see anything, but he knew. 
He flicked his bedroom lights on and off, off and on. And then he slipped into a pair of sweatpants and out of his room. On his way by his parents' bedroom, he stopped to listen to his father's rhythmic breathing. Murphy was in his backyard, sitting at the picnic table. Sam slipped out the back door. What's going on? I went and checked, said Murphy. It is him. I saw him. What are we going to do, said Sam. Tomorrow night, said Murphy. We're going to free him. (laughs) Murphy held out his hand. He was holding a key. The boiler room, said Sam. It was part question, but mostly it was a statement. Sam already knew the answer. When the board cut back on its custodial staff, Wally was too far down the seniority list to hold on to his day shift at Sam's school. They put him on the night shift. (laughs) And the night shift was lonely, lonelier even than window washing. The school felt unnatural at night, as hollow as an empty amusement park. And on the odd night when there were people, there were never kids. And the people were nothing but an irritant. A week ago, there was a staff meeting that dragged on and on, and Wally had to stay an hour later than usual. Tonight, a neighborhood committee was meeting to discuss speed limits. Wally knew that he would have to interrupt them several times before they'd clear out, and that whatever he did, there'd be stragglers left behind preventing him from locking up and getting home on time. Sam and Murphy didn't know anything about any of that. All Sam and Murphy knew was Wally was in trouble. All they knew was they had to do something. According to the plan, they were going to meet in the schoolyard at the top of the slide when everyone was asleep. Sam lay in bed staring at his alarm clock, willing it to move, praying it wouldn't, until all of a sudden it was time. He got up and he got dressed, and he carefully arranged a pile of laundry under his blankets the way Murphy had told him, trying to make it appear as if he was tucked in bed, asleep. Then he snuck downstairs and slid out the back door for the second time. He was wearing a backpack. He had packed a flashlight, a pen knife, two peanut butter sandwiches, a piece of rope, a baggie of dog biscuits in case there were dogs, (laughs) and a book to identify animal droppings. It was the middle of the night when he got to the schoolyard, at least 10 o'clock. And when he got there, he couldn't believe his eyes. There were cars in the parking lot, and there were lights on in the school. Somebody must have squealed on them. Murphy waved at him. Murphy was already underway. Murphy was half-crouched, zigging and zagging his way across the schoolyard like a commando. Sam ran after him, trying to catch up. Sam didn't want to be alone. The side door of the school was mysteriously open. Come on, said Murphy in the darkness. Sam could hear Murphy, but he couldn't see him. They came out into a hall at the back of the staff room. There were people in there talking. Shh, said Murphy. It's them. (laughs) Who? said Sam. The people who make you redundant. (laughs) Sam crept forward and peeked around the open door. He had never seen any of these people in his life. There was a man standing up saying something. It happened again last night, said the man. Somebody is going to get killed one of these days. See, said Murphy. It is them. It was Murphy. Murphy, who had done morning announcements three times already that year, who got them into the vice principal's office and onto the school PA. It was Murphy who leaned into the microphone, lowered his voice, and did his world-famous Darth Vader impersonation. (laughs) It's time for you to go now. Leave now while you still can. (laughs) 
Then he sat back and shrugged. Neither he nor Sam heard the ripple of laughter in the staff room where the neighborhood traffic committee had been arguing about speed limits for the past two and a half hours. Murphy flicked off the PA and he and Sam flew to the window. When they saw cars pulling out of the parking lot, they high-fived each other. (laughs) Wally's office is in the boiler room. Murphy used his key to open the boiler room door. It's dark and gloomy in there. The ceiling is low and the corridor is narrow. There are pipes everywhere, on the walls and on the ceilings. It's like a dungeon. Murphy said, come on. Wally was sitting at his desk beside the boiler. The boy stood in the doorway for maybe a minute without saying anything. Wally didn't see them at first. And then he must have sensed them. And he glanced up and saw the two of them standing there in the gloom like two ghosts. The sight of them should have startled him. But after you spend 12 years hanging over the edge of high rises day in and day out, you don't startle easily. Hello, boys, he said. Was that you on the PA? (laughs) Murphy nodded. Murphy reached into his pocket and pulled out the key. Murphy took a step towards Wally and held out the key and said, You're free to go now. (laughs) Wally looked stunned. Murphy whispered to Sam, It'll take a while for him to recover from the redundancy. (laughs) It's okay, said Murphy. They're gone. All of them, said Wally. They're not hanging around the doors. All of them, said Sam. You're safe. You can go. I thought they'd never leave, said Wally, glancing at his watch. He wanted to walk them home, but they went alone. We're okay, said Murphy. Did you see how fast he wanted to get out of there, said Sam. They were in Sam's backyard. They were sitting at the picnic table again. Swear you'll never tell, said Murphy. I swear, said Sam. And they shook hands. Five minutes later, Sam was pulling on his Spider-Man pajamas when he froze in horror. The pile of laundry he had stuffed under his covers was piled neatly on his desk chair. (laughs) Sam stared at his bed in the darkness. He took a deep breath. He let it out slowly. The lump in his bed moved. (laughs) Hi, said the lump. Hi, said Sam. It was his father. Sam was the first to say something. Sam said, I can't tell you what I've been doing. (laughs) Did you take an oath, said Dave? Yes, said Sam. Must have been very important to keep you up so late, said Dave. Yes, said Sam, it was. I've been pretty worried, said Dave. Me too, said Sam. Sam exhaled slowly, and then he crawled into bed with his father. They lay there in the darkness, and then Dave said, Can you tell me anything? Sam smiled. I can tell you one thing, he said. And Sam reached out and pulled his father's ear to his mouth, and he whispered, I have radioactive blood. Wally reappeared on day shift about a month later. The ongoing battle over the drain, not to mention a nasty wave of stomach flu, convinced the new janitor that early retirement wasn't such a bad idea. (laughs) Wally came back. And the schoolyard drain is plugged solid again, just the way it should be. Only a very select circle know about Sam and Murphy's night in the school and how they saved Wally from redundancy. Some of the boys say it's not true. They say they weren't even there. That's what Mark Portnoy was saying at recess a few weeks ago. Mark had Murphy pinned against his locker and was threatening to take his lunch when Wally came along and Mark had to let him go. Mark thought he could save face by asking Wally outright. He says him and Snotnose snuck in here one night and saved you from the recumbent people.
Wally looked quizzically at Murphy and then at Sam, who was there too. And then he looked at Mark Portnoy and said, as a matter of fact, those people would probably still be there making their plans if it weren't for these two. <laughs> then he took Mark Portnoy down to his office and he gave him a muffin and some coffee from his thermos. And Mark forgot about Murphy's lunch. And truth be known, Mark has been treating both Sam and Murphy with what almost passes as respect ever since. <laughs>